same thing for you. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. We'll get into this thing and tear it apart. Father, I thank you and praise you for everything that you've given. Thank you for the revelation knowledge, for the information that you've given us. Father, to give us insight in the plans of the enemy. And Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for blessing and keeping. We thank you for all of the exciting new tools that you provided Ephraim to absolutely push your people forward. Well, thank you for it, Father. Be with us, bless us in everything that we do and say. Let it be to your glory. In Yeshua's name, amen. So what we're going to do here I'm going to go ahead and do this. I didn't, as you can tell, I'm using the virtual screen. Uh, I did not get a chance to set up the other one. Uh, here we go. So we're going to share screen a little bit. And we're going to get into this. This one came out. Uh, yeah, there we go. Bingo. So this one, as I was meditating and uh, praying this morning, uh, this one just came to me. And, and uh, it came out of, I've got to tell you, uh, a little short thing that I saw uh, a chap from Canada named Jordan Peterson. Many of you know him. Uh, give credit where credit is due, right? He started uh, the trail, I guess. When I heard that, uh, it got to thinking and it started to make sense and it clicked and I connected, do what I do and connect the dots. And you know what? This really makes sense and it really adds credence to what went on and why it went on and why it's still going on today. So I want to look at good versus evil. And we're going to take a look at uh, all the different things that are that are part of this and why how good versus evil, tragedy versus evil, and different things like that. What's going on with, with all of those things? And how did that relate way back into the garden? And what was going on there? And how did the enemy play this out? And how do those things travel right through time and right through to our present age? What this talk will cover is tragedy and evil defined and differentiated, I might say. Uh, limitations and being, how that all plays into it, why we have to have limitations and how that's set up. Vulnerability and the human experience and the infinite versus the finite and how that interaction all goes. The base conflict, the conflict that exists between the bounded finite, which is us, we're bound in space and time, and the unbounded infinite God. He's everywhere, he's all, and this is where the problem, many problems, really arise. First, the finite's overwhelmed by the infinite. Uh, we can't comprehend God. We don't understand God. We don't have a good grasp on really who God is or what he is. And it's not sacrilegious to say what, uh, because God is so far above our understanding. Uh, we get glimpse and pieces, but do we truly know God? And we're, I'm telling you, um, I'm finding out every day, every week, something new about this limitless, awesome God that we serve. We don't have the ability. After the fall in the garden, where we had that contact, where Adam walked with the Father, physically, he was right there. We've lost that. We don't, we don't have to comprehend that, right? 
We don't know, we can't really wrap our minds around eternity. And this may help clear up some of that. The next thing we realize that our days are numbered. We are vulnerable to attacks and events that make us suffer. How many of you know, in this world, you will have troubles. You're going to have trials. Yeshua himself said it. Yeshua didn't skate through this world on a path of roses and every little thing just fell right into place. He had not heads that came against him. He had people trying to kill him. Eventually, they did kill him. They beat him. They tortured him. They hung him on a cross. Did he get out of this world unscathed? No. It's part of what the human experience is. And C, those factors give us the motivation to become better protected, you know, food, health, procreation, housing, clothing, the list goes on. Because we're vulnerable, we look and we search on how to make us less vulnerable. Uh, if, you're, if you're living in the Caribbean and you're in a little grass hut, your dream may be to build something out of cement blocks. So when the wind blows and you know it's gonna blow, uh, it doesn't blow your house down, you know, kind of the three little pigs story. That's what we're, that's what really all of this, the trials, the trouble, the vulnerability that we have. Uh, think about it. Do a lot of animals worry about, you know, I think of our cows, I think of, of the buffalo out on the, on the range and everything. Do they worry about building a fortress for the winter? Do they worry about stores and putting up and doing all those things? No, they, they eat the grass that's up today. If there's no grass, they move on. They find some more. When it snows, they dig around and find some grass or something to chew on. And that's the way it is. And hopefully, like the white-tailed deer that just devour enormous amounts of acorns in the fall to get enough fat to carry them through the winter if things get lean. But that's about the extent of it. Some hibernate, some, some like squirrels store up some nuts and things like that. But for the most part, they don't do what we do. They don't look to the future. All they can see is one season to the next. They're not putting up for five, 10 years. When I retire, I can just live on my nut stash. They, they don't do that. That's unique to our experience. Here's a Jewish commentary on God that says, if God, Jehovah, is omnipresent everywhere all at the same time, includes the past, present, and future. He's everywhere in all times. And, and just that statement is uh, mind-blowing. How can he be? We're so limited in our knowledge because we're, we're, all we know is time and how time marches on, seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, years. And we just can't comprehend how God can be in the past, in the present, and already in the future. It's hard for us to fathom. Although, I must say, uh, quantum physics is beginning to understand how that could be possible when you go outside the defined wavelengths and you get up into the other side. And I think I covered this on another video a few weeks or months back, that when you get outside of that, the particle, that wave function, absolutely ceases and it can float. It can be anywhere, past, present, future, until there's a focus that draws it back into our dimension, if you will. It sounds kind of science fiction type of stuff, but I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's powerful when you get a hold of it. Science really is absolutely validating what we've known about God's presence. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful, the very essence and creation of all things. He is the one and only source of everything. He's omniscient. Uh, he knows everything, no secrets, no mysteries, no unsolved. What does he lack? There's the question. There's the riddle. 
if God is all of these things, what does he lack? You might say he's not lacking anything. He's got it all. But here's where it gets interesting. He acts limitation. He has no limits. And when we understand that, where there's no limitation, there's no being. And I think I had a discussion with, with uh, a sister here a while back. We have this misconception because the only way that our human brain can, can really get a hold of God and understand what he is and how he operates as a father figure. You know, uh, we've had artists and renditions and things like that that, that put him as a gray-haired, long-bearded old man sitting on a chair with a flowing white gown and a staff in his hand, kind of a cross between a king and a grandfather. And that's not God. He's not limited to one location. He's everywhere. And he's so much bigger than, than what that would be. If we say God is on his throne in heaven, that would limit him to one place at one time. And we know by our last statement that God is limitless. We understand then that when I make the statement, there is no being, I'm not saying there is no God. I'm saying he is not one, like I'm one person. Although I have a spiritual component that you could say, okay, there's two of us, there's whatever. But God is so much more than that. Let's play a game, okay? Ready? You go first. Now, what are you going to do if somebody walks up to you and, and gives you that question? Let's play a game. You go first. Well, you're going to have a myriad of questions, but what are you going to do? What's your response? Most people are stunned by the infinite freedom. You've got you've got the ability to do anything you want. You might say, okay, here, here's a deck of cards. Boom, we're going to play cards. Or you might say, there's a ball. Let's go kick a ball. You've got infinite, because when I asked you if you wanted to play a game, I didn't specify the game, right? Most people are stunned by the infinite freedom that they face into complete paralysis. They just stop. They lock up. They freeze up. They vapor lock, as we would say in the in the country and that is what it's like to be faced with a situation where there are no rules there are no guidelines there are no instructions we have to have a purpose we have to have a definition we have to have here we have to have limitations genesis 2:15 and the lord god took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, or the Garden East of Eden, depending on how, how you read that, but the Garden, to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the Garden, but you will not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, good and evil, for the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, so consider this. Until that moment, they had never known there even was good and evil. When he took Adam and said, okay, here's the rules. Here's the garden. Adam, I'm giving you a job. I'm giving you dominion over everything that's here. Remember, if you go back a few verses, he said, I will give man dominion over all of this creation. He put him in charge. He was the caretaker. He was the overseer, if you will. God gave Adam the rules of the game. Keep and dress the garden. Work a job. No other creature had been given that kind of responsibility. Not not any created thing, not any angelic force. Man was in full control of this creation. He was the steward of God's creation. 
and he gave him a limitation. Don't eat from that one tree. Don't eat that fruit from that. Everything else is good for you. You can eat any other tree, any other herb, grass, vegetable, fruit, whatever's growing. This one tree, you can't touch it. I always wondered if God knew that that was going to get us in trouble, why in the world did he put it there? And I, how many of you are nodding your head going, yeah, well, it seems like a cruel joke to do something just so people could stumble over it. I mean, after all, doesn't even Torah say, don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind man? Well, isn't that what God did here? In fact, it wasn't. And there's an, a, a reason. And it comes right down there at the bottom. No limits, no being. If, if there was nothing there, and we can kind of use this uh, to describe the angelic forces, do the angelic forces have limitations? Well, they do to a point. They, they're not God, so they're not all powerful. They're not all knowing. They're not uh, uh, everywhere all at the same time. So they're really not God. So they do have some limitations, even in that respect. So are they really beings? Yes, they are separate from the Father. So I guess you could say that there are angelic beings and there are humans, human beings, right? Vulnerability. Now, when we understand that we need limitations, we'll get more into it. The quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. And I could throw in there spiritually as well. In the garden, man felt safe, secured, loved. He had purpose and clear limits. He had a set of rules, right? Although it was just one, he had a clear, definite containment field. Life was simple and good. Man had need of nothing. Everything that he needed was there. He had absolutely no reason other than to still tend and keep that tree. And mind you, the tree uh, of life was in there as well, along with, now, do you ever notice that God didn't say, oh, by the way, keep your hands off the tree of life as well? He didn't do that. There's a reason God wanted us to have life. But we didn't need that knowledge of good and evil. There had to be the possibility, the vulnerability of man to get in trouble, to disobey, to make this whole thing work. He had to have that in order to keep the confines of this reality together. Otherwise, it would not be a reality. Right. I know it's kind of kind of existential and, and kind of woo woo out there. But when you really stop and think about it, it'll all make sense. Tragedy. Let's look at tragedy. An event causing great suffering, destruction and distress, such as a serious accident, a crime, natural catastrophe, something that happens, whether it's a tornado, a hurricane, an earthquake, a wildfire comes through. Um, you know, these are things that happen like a car accident or somebody falls off a roof or, you know, you name it. Uh, uh, something falls out of the sky and, and hits them, hurts them, kills them, whatever. It's tragic. A rare disease comes up. Life happens kind of stuff, you know. It's not a re direct result of our actions. We didn't plan it. We didn't volunteer to take part in it. It wasn't malicious. It didn't have the intent to go out and do what it did. Kind of a, an example there, personal sin, where we did it, we intentionally did it, or generational sins, where we are dealing with 
uh, the baggage and the spiritual component that somebody else down in our history, our family, gave us, and now we're still dealing with that. Now, evil, one more definition here, evil, profound immorality and wickedness, especially when regarded as a supernatural force. You know, we're looking at the devil is evil, Hitler is evil, uh, on and on and on it goes, right? Better define it when you look at it in that content, actions or events that are characterized by the lack of necessity and volunteerism. Jordan Peterson, that was the one thing that popped up this morning. And as I thought about that, it's like, wow, you know, a, a, a clear uh, example of that. It's a hunting accident. You know, you, you're up in the tree stand, you see something move, you shoot before you know really what's there. And unfortunately, it was another hunter. That's a tragedy. You didn't intend to shoot him. It was an unfortunate thing, but it happened. Versus a school shooting where somebody intentionally and maliciously grabbed a gun, walks into a school, and starts shooting innocent teachers, children, whoever's standing by. That's evil. That's, that's about the best description, example that I could give you for tragedy versus evil. Do you see the difference? You see why it's, it's important for us to know, because many times we say tragic events are caused by evil. Yes and no. There could be things that are put in, in, in motion, but in our lives, if we didn't take a personal uh, a personal action or volunteer to do it, right, with an intent, then it's merely a tragedy. And those tragedies work for good in our lives. They can bring us together. You know, and, and you can go on and on and on of people that have been through tragedy and come out the other side. And you know what? It was actually one of their defining moments. Evil has two characteristics. Now, this you got to understand. Arrogance and resentment. Evil will always come up with a sense of arrogance. And I'm sure some faces are popping into your mind right now. And resentment. You know, when you when you look at some political figures and some world leaders that are out there, uh, they fit this exactly. When you start to see these two attributes, these two characteristics, look out. Then when you combine that with their actions that are neither necessary and they volunteered to do them, they didn't have to do them, they weren't forced to do them, but they're doing it to further their agenda, that is evil. Now, like I said, my, my mind started spinning. I can think of many examples. I won't get into that right now. I'd like this to keep going out on the airwaves instead of getting cut. So what do we see in the Genesis narrative? Now, the serpent was more tricky than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, really? Has God said, you will not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, and I'm going to go back. Let me backpedal a minute here. It says, now the serpent was more tricky. This was a demonic possession, just like uh, when, when we see Yeshua casting out uh, that legion of spirits out of the herd, and they went into the swine and then went down, and that's what this is all about. Uh, Satan came in, used whatever he could, what they were familiar with. They weren't afraid of the snake at that time. Uh, the snake was there, and, you know, they hung out with the snake. Snake wasn't a problem. They were familiar with it. There was no fear. There was no anxiety there. And the serpent used that. Really, has God said you will not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you will not eat of it, neither will you touch it, lest you die. The servant said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that the day you eat of it, then your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's knowing good and bad, good and evil. Here we see the first seeds of doubts planted. Then we see the seed of arrogance, then exploitation of vulnerability. Just as we laid out a moment ago, you can see now the pattern that Satan was using. Genesis 3 continued, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, see, there it is. Number one, uh, the seed of doubt was planted. Really? God, God said that? He didn't really mean that. You misunderstood him. His intent's all wrong. He wants to keep you down. You should be liberated. You should be as a God, right? A tree to be desired to make one wise. Well, she wanted to know. She knew there was a limitation. She knew that with her limitations, she didn't know everything. And her vulnerability, because that could leave her open to, well, what don't I know? I know what I know, but what I don't know scares me. And that drives a lot of people really crazy. So she took the fruit of it and ate it and gave it to her husband and he ate and the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. Now here we got a lot of uh, different theories on what that meant. Were they walking around totally naked? Did they have something, some kind of clothing? Did the Shekinah glory surround them? Let's just focus right now on, on the mind. Consciously, they had no idea there was no vulnerability, okay? They weren't worried about getting a thorn in some tender flesh. That's all I'm going to say. They weren't worried about sunburn. They weren't worried about nothing, okay? They had no concern with what was going on with their body or their external environment. They didn't know. They This is the way it is. Just like, uh, uh, you know, those cows out in the field. It's just life they don't know that they're you know vulnerable to attack they don't know that a, a wolf or a grizzly bear could be out there hunting them stalking them right now they don't know that uh, eventually they may wind up on the dinner plate they don't know that they live from day to day and that's all they know they didn't receive consciousness, self-awareness. That's the key here. It's when we become self-aware of our vulnerability. Go back and look at the definition of vulnerability again. That's when we get into trouble. So they, they, they eyes were open, their consciousness was expanded, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Was it really that way or was it a metaphor? I'm not going to argue either way. Either way, it works. The biggest thing is their mind was open. They realized lack and limitation for the first time in their existence. The fall, though, began way before the garden. In Isaiah 14, how are they fallen from heaven, O shining sun of the dawn? How you, who did weaken the nations, are cut down to the ground. For you have said in your heart, I shall ascend into heaven. I shall exalt my throne above the stars of God. And there are the stars of God, whether that's in the other regions or he's talking about, I will exalt myself over the created angelic and human forces that God created. However you want to take that, it both works. 
I shall sit upon the mountain of the congregation in the recesses of the north. There, I think he was talking about physically having a throne on earth that he could sit on. I shall ascend above the heights of the clouds. I shall be like the most high. This is what got him into trouble. Again, you look at it, you've got arrogance and resentment all over it. He was arrogant thinking that he could be like the creator. He was the creation. That's like the pot tell, calling the potter, hey, get out of the way, let me do this. It doesn't work that way. So we have the arrogance factor. We have the resentment. He was mad at God because he didn't think that God was giving him enough credit or whatever else. I mean, this guy was, was at the top of the top of the top of the angelic created beings. He was in the presence of the most high God all the time. And yet he wanted more. And then we look, it, he volunteered. He wasn't forced to make this statement. He wasn't forced to go out and do anything else. Why would he? He had everything. So what happened? Somewhere, something tripped. And he said, I want more. And that evil intention came in. And there we go. This is where it started. In the heart. First, it was in the heart, a thought, the heart, then off the tongue. He spoke it out. Arrogance and resistant, resentment. Satan didn't like the fact that man was chosen to have dominion over his new creation. You kind of almost wonder if, if Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, wasn't watching the creation of earth. As God was forming it, thinking, yeah, yeah, boys, like I'm number one. He's gonna, he's gonna have me go down there and take care of it. You you just watch. You watch. You watch. He'll he'll have me. And then when he started, hey, what is he, what is he making that? Wait a minute, he did not just give them dominion. He he could now that's my position. I'm just saying it fits whether that's the way it went or not, I can't tell you. I'm not going to say that's gospel. That's not revelation knowledge. I'm just thinking it fits with the pattern that's going on. You think about it. Then the same lie was used on Adam in the garden. You will be like gods. Omnipotent. You will not die. You'll be immortal. Omnipresent. You will know. Omniscient. You have all these things that will make you wise. You're not going to die. You're going to live forever, and you'll be like God's. Isn't that the same thing that was planted in Satan's heart? More in Genesis 3, and the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. We talked about that a minute ago. They were self-aware. They were self-conscious. And they sewed fig leaves together, made them aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Isn't it ironic? The God that created everything, you don't think he could see through a few bushes? You don't think he knew exactly where they were? Sure he did. But we're given an example here, uh, a metaphor, if you will, where God came down and, and they hid. Why did they hide? Because they knew they were vulnerable. That vulnerability got him into trouble. And the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And he said, Adam. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded that you should not? Well, Father already knew. He knew the instant. He knew before it happened that this was going to happen. But he had to give man choice. If he simply pulled the tree out and just put man in, uh, he would be nothing more than 
and then a lab experiment. And by the way, you know, I heard a, and again, Jordan Peterson used this uh, analogy when he talked about it. He said, you know, you love your kids, you bring them in, they're fragile, you got to work with them and, and do everything else. And wouldn't it be nice if you could give them a steel skeletal frame and clothe their skin would be some kind of like a, a cast iron exoskeleton that, that uh, they would absolutely not be impervious to all injury, all harm. You gave them a, an automated computing system that far beyond any cognitive ability that would keep them from making bad decisions. But in the end, would they then be as special as what they are when they're vulnerable? when they have the limitations, when they go through the trials and the troubles. And after all, if you did that, would they need mom and dad anymore? No, they wouldn't. And that's part of the other thing that God had to present that to keep us. He has to give us limitation. He has to keep us somewhat dependent because if not, we're gonna go off and say, I'm all there is. And that's where every time people get in trouble. Then we see it again in Cain and Abel as we close up here. The struggle to reach out to the infinite God through sacrifices. This story, again, plays on and on and on through history, throughout time. It's going on today. The struggle to reach out, and they do it through sacrifices. Some people are doing it through yoga and incantations and witchcraft and on and on it goes, right? Realization of vulnerability. That's the driving force that keeps us pushing out, keeps us going. That we've got to build a world around us so we can feel secure. And in today's world, it's getting increasingly more difficult to have that peace, right? The curse of work. When Adam was sent out, God said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to make it hard on you. It ain't going to be easy. You're going to have to toil. You're going to have to, to uh, weed the garden. You're going to have to work now. And he put something in man there because of the vulnerability that a harvest wasn't just insured. A harvest was going to be in seasons now, and he's going to have to start to store up. He's going to have to start to do things differently than he ever has before. Arrogance and resentment. You know, what did Cain show when he went over and, and got jealous? He said, I should be accepted by the Lord God and not you. And he wound up killing his, his brother. He, evil followed. Unnecessary? Yeah, he didn't need to kill his brother. Just like uh, Adam and Eve didn't need to eat of that tree. They had plenty. They had everything they needed. There was no necessity to go over to that fruit none other than they felt vulnerable they felt like they were missing out and that's what got them into trouble so that's going to end up everything here for this talk i hope that uh, i hope it makes sense to you the limitations that we have, we have to have these limitations in effect because it gives us boundaries. It keeps us searching for a limitless God. If we get outside of that, we have no need for God. And we've got to understand that we are not the creator. We are the creation. And that, yes, we can, we can draw from that limitless power and supply. But ultimately, it's his power, his glory, his ability that we draw on.
apart from him, if he would pull his, his essence, his life force from us, we return to the dust in which he was created. You know, it always uh, amazed me here. I shouldn't say always because I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. It didn't really register that man's the only created being on this earth or in this universe, you could say too, that was formed from the dust of the earth. Everything else was just spoken into creation. The dogs, the cattle, the fish, the birds, everything else, all the plants, all the one, all created from a spoken word. Man was created with a special link, a special bond to the planet. And we don't fully understand all of it yet, but there is a link. How many times that now people are saying, look, you need to get out in nature. You need to, in fact, to the point of take off your shoes once in a while and walk on the grass, walk on the earth. Uh, we've got resonance. We know that the earth vibrates at 7.83 hertz. And there is a, a special healing process that takes place when we uh, listen, get that in our gateways, and, and kind of get our resonant tuning in line. There's something here, and there's more to be discovered. But then he put into us his life force, his spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, right? He breathed that life. He gave us the essence. He didn't do it with any of the other created beings, but he did with man. So there's something, it's not just about breathing. It's not just without uh, uh, about waking up and, and going through life every day like an animal would. It's about being in the image of God. Let's close. Father, I thank you and praise you for the limitless, boundless creator that you are. And Father, that you have blessed us with your presence, with your essence. And Father God, be with us. Help us to use this information to understand the plans of the enemy and to understand how to identify truly evil purposes and plans. And Father, we thank you for the knowledge, for the information. Be with us. Bless. Be with all our brothers and sisters, those who are here and those who are yet to come in, and those who may be out there that, that have left our presence, left our fellowship, Father, if they have a need in their life, if they have something that, that isn't quite going, Father God, send your presence to be with them. And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Now, Father, reach out and touch. Reach out and touch and heal. I'm seeing somebody's having some issues with the eyes. Father God, in the name of Yeshua, I command a miracle healing in these eyes. That the sight would be restored. Father God, that all the damage, the, the nerve endings, whatever else is going on, all the, the things that would keep that one from seeing, Father, that those eyes would be clear and pure and bright. In the name of Yeshua, be healed. Be healed. Thank you, Father, for all of it. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right. Well, folks, thank you. Uh, glad we only got through with one little glitch. And uh, praise God. We'll see you again next week. Shalom. Keep the prayers. If you've got prayers and you've got things like that, please don't hesitate. Get a hold of Ephraim International Ministries and uh, send in your prayer request. We'd love to pray for you. We're here for you. Uh, we've seen God do some miraculous things. And, and I just know 
in my heart of hearts that God wants to do great things in your life. Shalom until next week. Thank you.